This world has gone, it's gone crazy. It's gone crazy. Those of y'all that are my age, I'm, I'm uh, 63 years old, you know what I'm talking about. You, you young people may not may not see it, but we do. We do, and it's it's gone crazy. And you have friends and family members that are downtrodden and, and depressed and and, and upset and uh, always they're 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 grumbling instead of smiling. Bring them, bring them here. Amen. We will pray with them. The music, the worship, is delivers people from burdens. It, it releases us of burdens. Yesterday, as I was preparing for my uh, message today, which um, I do every Saturday, I, I all week long I listen to things and I read and I I, I, I study and then on Saturday, Saturday it comes it comes together, but. Yesterday, I, I, I wasn't feeling anything. Like, Lord, I, I ain't feeling it, Lord. What's, what's going on? God said to me, Bill, this isn't about emotions. The caboose does not drive the train. It's all right. You, keep, you push through. Just keep pushing through. But I'm not feeling it. Feeling what? What is it you want to feel? Well, King David said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And he did. He did. I, I, I feel it now. <laughs> and I'm glad about that. But, you know, I didn't stop writing my sermon. I took a nap. <laughs> but, I, but I didn't stop. I didn't stop writing the sermon. And, and um, you just push through. But you need that Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit push, that awakening and and. And the, the Lord doesn't want us up and down and up and down and oh, oh and a, you know, he doesn't want that. That's why King David said in Psalm 23, the, the, the still waters, you know, um, leadeth me by still waters and green pastures. It, it doesn't say, oh, he took me up to the highest mountain top and, and uh, I couldn't breathe up there and doesn't say that. Amen. The Lord just wants us to find his peace. I love the verse in the Bible that says that we are to be anxious for nothing. You say, may Pastor Bill, easy for you to say, well, I, the older I get, the, the less anxious I get about things, um, or it's not as frequent. We all we all get anxious. There's, there's cancer with Michelle. At first, I was very anxious. But the Bible says that that we are to come to the Lord uh, by prayer and supplication and make our requests known to Him. And it says, and the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Oh, I so recommend you memorize that verse. Well, don't forget the prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Did I leave that out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, that's the hard one. Yeah, that's the hard one. Yeah. 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 Memorizing scripture is so important. We, we just labor over things and we worry about things and we, we stress and, and, and and the Lord, look, look here, it's Sunday morning, we're in this wonderful facility, there's food back in the kitchen, we got diapers in the bathroom, we're good to go. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if, the, if the Russians dropped a bomb on whomever, we're good to go. It's all, it's, got, it's all good. It's all good. You know, don't worry. Don't worry. I sound like Joel Osteen, don't I? <laughs> I don't have his hair done. <laughs> We're going to talk about communion for a bit here, and I, everybody, close your eyes for a second. There we go. I, uh, I, I plagiarized a sermon. <laughs> I admit it. Look, I admit it, man. I, you know, all week long I, I'll listen to many 
many sermons. Um, I listen to sermons, I read books. Oh yeah. This one is so good that I, I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna share this particular sermon. But I don't know the name of the pastor. Um, I never seen him before, but it's it's amazing. So we're gonna talk about the power. We're gonna talk about the power of Passover and the power of communion. So let me get my iPad. Where is my iPad? Angie. Is it up here? Angie's gone. Angie's gone? Yeah, I'm taking care of the, like, cutting you off on the Instagram thing. Do you have the iPad? Is that it? Oh, yeah, that's it. Amen. Thank you, honey. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to share with you, before we have communion today, I want to talk to you about the power of the Lamb, about the power of communion. I I know that, um, I know that, uh, thank you, Chief, we'll, we'll get it in a bit. I know that the, um, when I, when I study about communion, gosh, how many times have you done communion in your life as a Christian? Once a month or, you know, a lot, hundreds, maybe thousands of times. And, and, and it, it, gosh, it almost becomes, you know, like a, like a ritual kind of thing. And it, it, we can't allow that. Um, what is that little baby's name? He, he's having a great time. She, sorry, I, I don't know. I can't see that far. Her name's Ellie. Huh? Her name's Ellie Grace. Hi, Ellie. She's having a good time. Amen. That's cute. Michelle and I had a grandbaby the other day. Yes. What day was it? Friday. Friday. A new baby. Another 11, baby boy. 11 pounds. 11 All natural, pounds. No epidural. Oh. At home. At home. At home. Oh, my goodness. Hard to believe, yeah. But everybody's well, praise God for that. Yeah, yeah. that's number six. For them. <laughs> number six for them, yeah. Number nine for us. Number nine. No, that was, that was Lexi. Lexi. They, uh, all right. So. Communion can become um, almost ritualistic, or it, it doesn't doesn't have the impact that it should. And I want to talk about that today. I, I, I want to talk about the power of communion, the, the power and the revival that it brings. Amen? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, as a matter of fact, if you have your Bible, do turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. That's our main uh, that's our main scripture for the day. I'm going to give you several. But 1 Corinthians. Hang on one second. I may have the wrong verse here. Stand by one second. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse 23. If you have a Bible. Amen. There we go. The Apostle Paul wrote this. And. And he writes here, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you. So the Apostle Paul, literally, you know, Paul was tutored by Jesus. He was mentored one-on-one. -on -one. The Bible says that he, he was in the Arabian desert. I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was for 14 years. Uh, he definitely was not with the apostles and disciples for a period of 14 years. He was trained by Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. And Jesus gave him this. So he says, I, I received this from the Lord. I deliver it to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup 
and after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me all right Jesus is the Passover lamb we're going to talk about Passover a little bit here too Jesus is the Passover lamb. John the Baptist actually said, Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so when, when they saw Jesus, when we in our spirit see Jesus, when we think of Jesus, we are seeing the Passover lamb. And the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, he took the cup, and he was speaking Passover language. Now, let me explain here for a minute. If you think of the first Passover, we find it in the book of Exodus, right? In Exodus 12. The, it, it, Jesus was a picture then, or that then was a picture of Jesus. Moses told them. You know, one-year-old lamb, a spotless lamb, right? Drain the blood from the lamb. The man of the home, the household, the blood drained into a basin. And he took a hyssop branch and he smeared it all down and across the top. And he smeared it down. And then they took the lamb, they, they, they skinned it, and they roasted it. They didn't boil it. They roasted it. And... And, and they, they, they ate it. And, with, and the, 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 the death angel that came, that Pharaoh called upon himself, he called it upon the nation of Egypt when he told Moses, surely if I see you again, well, I'm going to kill you. And Moses said, you shouldn't have said that. Bad move. And so the Passover lamb was, was eaten in, um, in a celebration because the, the death, that plague came and they were spared. And they were all spared. Furthermore, when they left Egypt, they not only left all of them, they left rich. They got all the goods from Egypt, the gold, the silver, the bronze, everything they left. And, and they were set free. They were saved. It was a picture of salvation. Now, you'll discover something interesting here that several years ago, there was a rabbi scholar. His name was Joseph Tabori. This was not too long ago, maybe within the last, oh, I don't know, five or ten years. And he discovered that during the time of the second temple, Jesus, which Jesus lived in that time, he discovered the Passover was done differently after hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years of it done, being done in the home. Whenever they did the Passover, when they celebrated it once a year on the, in, I think, uh, Nisan, the 14th of Nisan or something like that. And they, they did it at home. But Joseph Tabori did some digging. And what he discovered is that when it was moved into the temple, it wasn't done in a home anymore. Now, let me tell you why this is interesting. Because the Passover was initially done in the family, and the head of household was to do the ceremony. The blood, the hyssop around the door, roast the lamb. Now, this is interesting. You're going to like this. But after the, the, the temple was built, things, they were changed. And he, Joseph, discovered that the Passover lamb was prepared in a very special way. We, we think that maybe they just skinned it and, and threw it on the, on the fire or whatever. No, that's not what happened. And how do we know that? Well, an examination of the rabbinic evidence seems to show that the Jewish Paschal Lamb was presented in a manner which resembled a crucifixion. Let me, let me share more with you here. It says, that, and to, help, to help us understand this, there was a first century scholar, a brilliant man. His name was Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was a pagan. <laughs> he, was a, he was trouble. 
but he got saved. He got converted. And he wrote something uh, that's very interesting. If you want to look it up, you can. It's in the dialogue with Trifo the Jew. Make sure you take a note and write that down and look that up later. As a joke. You're probably not going to do that. Amen. Hey, Chief, what's the air set on? Yeah, it's hot in here, brother. Can you, can you ratchet down just a little bit, maybe over on this side of the building? We'll let this side be hot and this side can be cold. Just kidding. Okay, so here's what he wrote. Now think about this for a minute. They did the, the Passover at home. thousand years, 1,500 years. Then the second temple came along and they started doing the Passover sacrifice in the second temple. This is during the time of Jesus. So this guy named Joseph, Tabere, he discovers something happens here. And so he starts digging into the historical evidence and he discovers this. Justin Martyr wrote, For the lamb that is roasted is roasted and dressed in the form of a cross. Yeah. And they took a, a, what was called a spit. <laughs> it's a stick. A sharp stick. It was all, you know, like a steak almost. And they would, drive, they would drain the blood from the lamb and they would skin the lamb. And they would drive a, a, a host into the uh, upper part or the lower part of the lamb and up through the body of the lamb, a post, a spit. You could call it a stave if you wanted to. And then they took another one and they put it through right here, I guess, through the, all the way through here. And it formed a cross. And then they took the legs of the little lamb. <laughs> And they, sorry, they, they tied them to them. This is true. This is historical evidence. What we know now is that the lamb, the lambs that they took home to complete the ceremony, this, the, the celebration, it was, it was on a cross. Jesus taking the unleavened bread, he says, take and eat. He says, this is my body given for you. Taking the cup, he says, take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant, the very thing that the prophet Jeremiah spoke about in chapter 31. Now, Jeremiah, of course, probably lived 800, 600, 800 years before Jesus. I want to read that to you. Jeremiah, you might want to write it down and, and, uh, and read it another time. But this is how we see the miracle and the power of Almighty God as he, he presents things thousands of years ago all the way up to the time of Christ. It's called prophecy. Right? God shows us clues. He shows us clues all the time. Here's what he said. Jeremiah wrote this, I don't know, hundreds of years before Jesus was alive. Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I'm in Jeremiah 31, 31. Yeah, Jeremiah 31. He says, I will make a new covenant. What did Jesus say the night that he was betrayed? This is the blood of the new covenant. With the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke. It's, it's sad that the, the, after they left Egypt, they broke the covenant. And for 40 years, they... They had to wander in a circle in the Sinai Desert because they they were rebellious. They were stiff-necked, stiff-necked people. And though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. 
He says, I will put my law within them, within their heart. I will write it on their heart. He says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. The bread, the cup, the covenant. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. When we take communion, well, the Lord has already forgiven our sins. He has forgiven the sins of all mankind. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross and he forgave the sins of all mankind every single one of us every human being that's right and whether or not someone receives this grace is not up to God it is up to them now my Calvin friends right now are throwing a fit <coughs> I'm sorry. Jesus died for the sins of all mankind. Yours, mine, Charlie Manson, Paul Pot, Stalin, yeah, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham. But we must receive the gift. And that's why coming to communion is so important. But we never want it to become mundane. Communion is more than just a doctrine. It is more than just a ritual. It is a powerful, life-changing reality. When you come in a few moments you take the, the element I'm going to ask you to, to hold them we're going to take them together as a group as a family when you take that it should be life changing God says the lamb has come the lamb is life the Lamb of God is like God fulfills what has been written throughout all the centuries. Think about it. The Passover, the Lamb, the cross that it's the Lamb literally presented on a cross. The, the Passover is mentioned all throughout the Old Testament. Exodus, they are saved. A year later, they do the Passover ceremony, and there's great revival. God is on the mountain. He's talking to the people. It's tremendous revival. There, we 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 see this in we see this in uh, in, in the the book of Numbers, chapter nine. You can look it up later. You can read about the revival that occurred with Passover. We find it in Joshua chapter six. If you're taking notes, write that down, or on the camera, write it down. We'll, we'll, uh, you can read about it later. Joshua took the people across the Jordan River. God dried up the Jordan River. All the Ammonites and Canaanites and Balaitites and he scared the dickens out of them, man. They go running for their life. They're coming across Gilgal, and, and these, these people are like, oh, my gosh, these people have a really powerful God. They go across the Jordan River. They rejoice. What do they do? They do the Passover ceremony, the celebration. It's a revival. We are free. We're finally out of the desert. We are free. Are you free today? Are you, are you free today? We, we see this again in, in 2 Kings chapter 23. Josiah the king. The kings, most of the kings before him were horrible. They were bringing in Baal worship and, and the, all these te this terrible stuff. Temple prostitutes and they were, they were not following God. But God is patient. Year after year after year, he's patient. Josiah comes in and he says, we're not doing this anymore. You can read about this later. It's in, it's in uh, 2 Kings. And Josiah takes all that stuff out. 
He says, get all those prostitutes out. Get all those Asher poles out. Get, get, burnt, take Baal and throw him over the cliff. We're not doing this anymore. We're going to worship Almighty God. And God says, Josiah, there hasn't been a Passover in a long, long time. He says, do a ceremony. Do a celebration. And they did it. And the people rejoiced. They, they were revived because of the Passover. The last time it's mentioned in the Old Testament, the Passover, is Ezra chapter 6. Remember Ezra? He's the guy that along with Nehemiah, the king, uh, Huma Makuba, I, <laughs> I forgot his name. It was Cyrus or, or, or Xerxes or somebody sends him back. Huma Kuba, that would be like from the Congo. He sends him back to, back to Israel. He says, go rebuild your temple. Go build the walls. Ezra says, man, let's celebrate. Let's have a Passover ceremony. The people rejoiced. They were revived. They were, they were, they were uh, in, in revival again. And, and, and the Passover is always associated with revival. How many times, I don't know about y'all, gosh, I sometimes I come to the communion table and I, I mean, I, I do it. I pray. Thank you, God. I, you should be dancing out of here. And I got good news for you. The praise band's coming back in a few minutes. And you just might be dancing when you hear the song we're going to do. It's about revival. Taking the communion is about revival. Amen. Amen. Not survival. It's about revival. God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin so that we may become the very righteousness of God. That's why I offered up the meal. It, it's, it, it's, it's powerful. It's, it's a breakthrough in our lives. The power that changes. The power that offers revival or should offer revival in your spirit. If you feel, listen to me on the camera, if you, if you feel no revival in your spirit, well, either something's really going wrong in your life, you may have a, a besetting sin that's just dragging you into the ditch, or you may not be saved. He's talking to the camera for a minute. I've told this so many times, everybody here knows this story. I, I was lost in a little back road in Georgia. I was a sales representative and I had on my nice suit and my tie and I, I pulled up to a gas station in the middle of nowhere. I was lost and, and there was a gentleman who was putting gasoline in a tractor it, and he, was a, he had on a hat and overalls and a, you know, <laughs> I was, he was chewing on something. I said, I'm lost. And he said, boy, you need to become saved. <laughs> if, you, if you feel no joy in your heart, you may not be saved. You say to me, Pastor Bill, I got, I got problems, I got issues. I know. I, we all do. We all do. But when we come and take this, the elements of communion, the Holy Spirit that resides within you, should quicken your spirit. You should feel re re revived, renewed, empowered. Even if the whole week was horrible. Are you with me? I'm almost done here, everybody. Don't check out on me just yet. Amen. I'm not talking about running around dancing. I'm, I'm talking about inside you're, you're lifted up in the name of Jesus Christ. We live in a time, oh, I could preach right now. I'm not going to because I, I don't have time. But, but let me tell you about, let me tell you that, that this is about the renewal of our souls. It's about the transformation of our minds. The Bible says that we are not to be conformed to this world. It, listen, Christian, listen to me if you're, not, if you're not following the Lord. You may have asked him to be your Savior, but maybe you haven't made him your Lord yet. <laughs> the Savior is what saved you. The Lord is what should rule your life. I'm not letting anybody run my life. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. By golly, I'm going to do this on my own. Cooey. <laughs> <laughs> That's just downright silly. My grandfather used to talk that way like, oh, Papa John. 
You know, really? Let him be the Lord of your life. Let let make make Jesus the Lord. You you're getting saved. It's it's it, the Lord the Lord is sovereign. He chooses you. You say yes or no. But the Lord's not going to beat you over the head with a stick to make you to have you make him the Lord. You make you make God the Lord of your life. That is your decision. If you love me, obey my commandments. My Father will love you. I too will love you and will make our home in your heart. If Jesus Christ is in your heart, who's in charge? Jesus, uh, Jesus is in charge. You may think you're in charge, but you're not. We were talking earlier about the President of the United States. Listen, God, God's the one who puts up the President of the United States. Joe can say whatever he wants. Don can say whatever he wants. Nancy can say whatever they want. At the end of the day, the President of the United States is picked by God. And God, please pick the right one. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> this is why the Apostle Paul said, What I receive from the Lord, I pass on to you. This is life changing. And it's designed to renew your souls. This is about Jesus. This communion is about Jesus. The Lamb of God who died for our sins. And I got good news for you. He's coming back. He is. Today, tomorrow, a year from now, ten years from now. I tell people all the time, years, not decades. I believe that. He's coming back. He's coming back. Will you be ready? Do you pray for revival in your soul? It starts, it starts with this communion meal. Revival in your soul. So if you're watching by camera, we're going to go to the communion table now. And so if you're at home, you can go get a piece of bread and what do you, water, juice, Mountain Dew, it, and have communion with us. So, beloved, um, let's have the praise band come back up, please. And there we go. I'm going to ask that you'll. That you'll come. We'll have, we'll have the praise band come, please. I'm going to ask that um, that you pick up the element and bring it back to your seat, because I'd like us to all partake together. Here, Sherry. Here, Mark. I'd like us to all partake together. And as you're holding, as you're as you're holding the the, the elements, we're going to. We're going to sing a song. And maybe for the first time in your life, and, and there may be somebody here today that has never taken communion. I, I don't know. I, it, for the first time in your life, let this be about revival in your life. Your sins are forgiven. They are as far as the east is from the west. There's nothing to drag along, to drag behind you. There's no, there's no bags. There's no list in heaven. God's not up in heaven writing your sins down. Jesus is keeping a list of the works that He called us to do, and the ones that we didn't do. But nobody's writing down a book of, of the sins. So the praise team is going to do a song. Please come and take the element. And then just, if you will, hold it in your chair, and we'll we'll partake together. Amen.
Stephanie. There she is. Oh, I'm glad you came down, Stephanie. That just dawned on me. Come on up and join us. Here to 
Jade. I don't really understand the meaning of this communion gift, this Passover lamb. I, I pray, Father God, that those that are watching by the camera, if, if they've never taken communion before and they're doing it now because of the words that they heard and message, I, I pray, Lord, that you would literally send your Holy Spirit upon them and overwhelm them with those tears, those tears of just years and years of, of not living for you, Jesus, and just wash that, just wash them, just wash them overcome them in the name of Jesus Christ and, and, and cause not just them but all of us to repent. Most of us do not need to, to cry the, the tears of God in sorrow because we are saved. But we all need to repent. So help us to repent, God. Help us to say no to this or that, whatever it is in our life that is that right now might be small, but it, 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 it will destroy us in time, cause us to repent and turn away from that. So we say we're sorry for our sins. And I pray, Lord, that you remove any, any hatred, any, any fear. Just remove that, Jesus, and allow us to take to take the take your your body, the, the bread, and receive it. We take it now and receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father God, as we hold the cup. We remember your words. This is Jesus said, This is my blood, the new covenant, the forgiveness of sins. And all all we can say is is thank you, Jesus. That's, help us to help us to, to navigate life putting you first each day throughout the day. Give us the assignments that you have for us. Let us lay, lay down at night without distraction and just put our head on our pillow and, and have a sweet sleep. So we take this cup in the name of Jesus Christ.